Okay, so today we're talking about the ozone layer. It's the same reading um, you know, that I signed last time. It covers this week and next week. And then we're going to talk about climate change. There will be a new um, chapter with that. So I'll try to go through these. Um, there's some leftovers from last time that I didn't get to, which is pretty much true every semester. We do this, it's the same leftovers. But they're all related specifically to atmospheric ozone. So um, we'll just jump into those and then move right into the stuff for today. So we're going to talk today pretty much about uh, the natural ozone cycle and features of polar weather, which help promote ozone thinning naturally. And then we'll talk about human perturbations. And it's really disentangling these two things, which has been a challenge for people in understanding how much duration was there in the ozone layer before chlorofluorocarbons were introduced to the atmosphere in the 40s. And so this is kind of reduced by time series measurements. Then we'll talk about some um, atmospheric cycles for ozone depleting chemicals, such as CFC-11 and various other halo carbons. And then we'll spend a little bit of time focusing on CFC-11. What's it doing these days? What was it doing in the past? How have we modified behaviors? And then there's a longish section on the end about methyl bromide, which is a type of halon. It's got a very large amount of natural production as well as some anthropogenic production. There's some question marks about how much natural versus anthropogenic and how much is this being perturbed. It's not a regulated chemical like this one is. And so in the end, we'll conclude that yes, this is a small part of atmospheric halogen production, but probably not a significant, the anthropogenic part is not significant, but we have to go through a bunch of steps to sort of prove that that's the case. Whereas this one really is significant in some other halons, though they are significant too, and the other halons are not regulated. <clears throat> so this is kind of a summary of the stuff that's important for the ozone layer and the so-called ozone bowl. The first and most important thing are natural chemical reactions that result in the production and destruction of ozone, which we talked about last time. These are primarily catalytic formation of ozone by the combination of oxygen atoms and oxygen molecules and catalytic destruction of ozone by a variety of different radicals, including halogens and various other chemical species. Then there are seasonal variations, obviously in incident sunlight. Since this is photochemistry, photochemical reactions don't happen when it's dark over a particular area of the planet. And so for the polar regions, which are bathed in darkness for multiple months, they go into a period of stasis where these chemical reactions aren't happening. We build up the reactants so that when the light comes back on in the springtime, the chemical reactants go on gangbusters. And these are part of what contributes to natural ozone thinning. There are special features of polar weather which isolate part of the atmosphere over the poles and keep it sort of separate from the rest of the atmosphere, which allows this sort of mixture to stew and these processes to be enhanced. Um, and then <clears throat> there are in IMD the addition of ozone depleting chemicals by humans. We've definitely done this. It's a question of how much have we done this? How much variation was there before? And we'll look at various kinds of ways that people try to quantify this. But the reality is that we started introducing ozone depleting chemicals to the atmosphere in the 40s. And people didn't realize it was having an effect until the 70s. And so by that point in time, um, there was probably already some degradation continuing on through the next several decades at in greater and greater intensity. But we don't know the extent to which the atmosphere was already compromised in, for instance, 1970, or to what extent those were natural variations from natural sources of ozone depleting chemicals, of which there are plenty. And then the final one is the presence of active surfaces, which I've alluded to before. These are particulates that get into the atmosphere. And it can be natural sources, such as volcanic uh, eruptions that, that you know punctuate the tropopause and go to the stratosphere. They can be things from human activities like uh, airplane flights. So humans have again introduced more active surfaces, but it's not like they weren't there beforehand. So the first important thing, this is one of the slides from last time, that's why it's got this yellowish color, is how is ozone quantified? Ozone is quantified with something called a DU or a Dobson. It's a kind of an obtuse unit, but we're just going to look at it in a relative sense. If we see 300 or 180 or 100, we'll know that it's pretty high 
you know, middle of the road or very low. And a DU is basically a measure of the total ozone. So you can do make this measurement in multiple ways. You can send something up uh, that absorbs light from the surface of the earth up out. You can look from a satellite down at things that absorb, or you can send a weather balloon up and make measurements and then take an integration. But in essence, what you do is you measure the total ozone that's present in that column of air and you condense it down into a layer of pure ozone that is at one atmosphere um, pressure, zero degrees C, and makes a 0.01 millimeter layer of ozone. That would be one dopsin unit. So 100 dopsin units would make a millimeter of pure ozone at atmospheric pressure. 300 dopsin units would be three millimeters. So it's, it's a real, relatively small amount. So one of the things naturally we know that has an effect on ozone are volcanic eruptions. One of the best ones that we study is the 1991 eruption of Mount Pinatubo, which happened in the Philippines. It's believed to have caused about a 9 to 12% drop in ozone over North America. So this isn't even over the polar regions. The ash plume from Pinatubo you know, surrounded the entire globe. We'll see later when we talk about global warming. It's also thought to have contributed to several years of global cooling by putting particles in the atmosphere, which um, you know contribute to increasing our albedo and was one of the things that threw off some people when they were trying to quantify climate change, just in a period of time when the warming was really starting to kick in. Um, but so it also causes drop in the ozone. And the drop is thought to have happened by two ways. Um, the primary mechanism is the formation of nitric acid droplets. And we'll see that nitric acid and um, the reaction with nitric acid and chlorine is an important part of the natural mechanism for destruction of ozone. So this probably was part of the contribution. There were also volcanic sulfate aerosols, particles in the atmosphere that contributed to the atmospheric um, sort of reactivity, which allowed the reactions to take place. So there's this chemical species ClONO2, which is like nitric acid. We have a whole slide where we talk about it which in the presence of light breaks down to make chlorine radicals, which can then contribute to ozone destruction as we talked about last time. But um, when this is one of the more stable forms of chlorine, it's not super stable, but it's more stable than these two forms, which both react with ozone really uh, intensely. And so <clears throat> adding this material in the active surfaces in a net sense contributed to the balance of things that cause ozone depletion, but only lasted for a few years. Okay, so another important thing to know about ozone layer, which I alluded to before, is that it filters ultraviolet light. That's just the ultraviolet light spectrum showing you UVA, B, and C. Um, you buy sunscreens, they usually are filtering UVA, sometimes filtering UVB. Um, we don't worry too much about UVC because it's such a low wavelength of light for the most part the um, ozone layer takes care of filtering that so it doesn't reach the surface of the earth. But if you remember last time, I showed you that plot showing you the crossover point at about 280 nanometers where um, UV light is very, very destructive to um, DNA and other biomolecules. <clears throat> so it's important that we have an ozone layer. Another kind of feature to think about is where's the incident light on earth and how does that vary geographically? And we've talked about this a little bit before. It will become important again when we talk about climate and climate change. But for now, it's just important to remember that the high latitudes during their summer months, um, which are off by six months between the two poles, the very high latitudes, they receive a lot of solar radiation part for part of the year and no solar radiation for other parts of the year. Lower latitudes, like we are in, have more constant light. Okay. And so since we're talking about photochemistry here, chemical reactions that require light are more constant in how they progress in the low latitudes than they are in a high latitude because it's swing of incident solar radiation. So we see bigger variations in ozone production and destruction. And this is what contributes to getting a quote unquote ozone hole over the poles. So I'm gonna show you a bunch of diagrams like this. This is the month of the year. So December, this is June, July, December again. So this is a whole annual cycle. And this is latitude on the planet. So this is the equator. That's 90 degrees south, south pole. That's 90 degrees north, the north pole. This is what ozone looked like in 1971. This is a contour plot 
for ozone in dobson units. So 280 dobson units would be 2.8 millimeters of dobson at atmospheric pressure on a surface area. So we took all the ozone at the South Pole and condensed it to a layer on the surface of the Earth. So you can look at this in a bunch of different ways. One thing to do is to say, well, how does it vary at the equator over time? It doesn't vary by very much in 1971. Between December, going through an entire year to December again, it goes from just below 260 to just over 260 to just below 260. It's pretty constant. Now if we go all the way to the poles, we'll see something different. And we see these are offset by six months. But if we look in the Southern Hemisphere, we'll see that it starts out here in December, which is the middle of the summer in the Southern Hemisphere, 340, 320, 300. It drops down to 280, and then it comes back up and peaks at about 380 in November. So that's a swing of about 100 out of approximately 400. So it's something like a 25% variation. This is in 1971. It's not pre-human activities, but it's pretty early on. So we have this sense that a lot of this variation is natural. Some of it is probably perturbed by human activities, but a lot of it's natural. If you went up here to the Northern Hemisphere, you'd see roughly the same thing over the poles, just offset by six months, that it has a peak in May and it has a valley in October at the same time that we're getting sort of a peak down here. So one pole is showing thinning while the other pole is showing thickening. And this is a pretty standard, like I say, feature. When you go to temperate latitudes, the Southern Hemisphere temperate latitudes, or the Northern Hemisphere temperate latitudes, you see some kind of intermediate variation. Not as much variation as at the poles, but more variation than at the equator. Okay, now there's this other kind of interesting feature about, I, I talked about, the, and we'll get into more detail about how the uh, weather over the poles and low um, elevation in the atmosphere becomes isolated. But these are winds uh, high up into the atmosphere, right? So remember the tropopause is somewhere over the poles is like 15, over where we are, it's maybe 25. So this is, you know, stratosphere going up in the mesosphere. There's these high elevation winds that tend to trade gases between the polar regions at different times of the year. So this is, um, you know, flow lines during heating in the southern hemisphere. So that would mean southern hemisphere summer, northern hemisphere winter. We tend to have the trading of gases. And so this helps promote the ozone depletion that happens in the poles for other reasons by mixing gases and particles and stuff between those two regions. There's another thing in the poles that we don't tend to get anywhere else, which are these polar stratospheric clouds. Um, because the tropopause is so low, we can transport some water vapor up into the stratosphere, the lowest part of the stratosphere, make clouds, which are basically accumulations of active particle surfaces, which allow chemical reactions to take place. And these are just some pictures of polar stratospheric clouds. One of the things that's interesting is in addition to water, they tend to hold a lot of nitrogen oxides, which is the thing that I said was implicated in um, the ozone destruction by um, Pinatubo. And it's something that humans add to the atmosphere, again, as uh, exhaust of jet engines. But this is probably the granddaddy. The thing that's most important is called the um, polar vortex. It's more intense over the southern hemisphere than the northern hemisphere. And part of this is, has to do with geography. If you think about looking at Earth, if you were looking from space and you were looking at the South Pole, you have Antarctica and then you have a circumpolar ocean, which develops a very strong circumpolar current, uh, oceanic current, which drives wind patterns and helps to isolate the air masses over Antarctica. Now, if you look down on the northern hemisphere, we have sort of the opposite. We have water and or ice um, at the polar region surrounded by continental masses, Alaska and Canada and Greenland and uh, Russia um, sort of being the main land masses. So in both cases, the spinning of the earth and the oceanic currents help set up this region of atmosphere, this kind of funnel shape that spins and densify. So the gases all tend to sort of um, descend closer to Earth because of this um, kind of spinning process. And it's more intense in the Southern Hemisphere. So this is the primary reason why the Southern Hemisphere ozone hole, when it develops, is more intense. There's an isolation where at, you know, these sort of relatively high um, latitudes, 75, 70 degrees, something like that, Everything that's lower than that becomes isolated because it's outside of this vortex and everything 
on the inside is part of the vortex. So that helps keep that part of the atmosphere isolated from the rest of the lower atmosphere, which allowed this um, um, destruction of ozone to take place in coupling with those other factors that I talked about. So this is kind of a summary of the chemistry. And like I say, this we believe happens naturally. There are sources of nitric acid to the atmosphere. There are sources of halogens to the atmosphere, chlorine. Um, it also happens with bromine and there are natural sources, but without a doubt, human activities have greatly enhanced the amount of chlorine and the amount of nitric acid. So there's this kind of <clears throat> catalytic cycle where we take some chemicals and we cause some ozone destruction and then we reproduce those same chemicals at the end. And it's all dependent on when we do and don't have ice. So these polar stratospheric clouds which have water ice, but they also have nitrogen oxides in them uh, as aerosol particles, sometimes combined with the water to make nitric acid uh, particles, they can accumulate chlorine and make this molecule ClOnO2, which I alluded to before. And that molecule is chemically analogous to nitric acid. Right, so ClONO2 is just like HONO2, that's what nitric acid is. So, chlorine, in if this were an aqueous solution, chlorine would be acting as a positive ion, not a traditional negative ion. This molecule, in the presence of light, so all winter it's kind of accumulating when there's no light, but in the presence of light, this breaks apart and releases a chlorine radical. And those chlorine radicals um, react with ozone. Okay, to make ClO, which is another radical. We talked about that before. Um, ClO can combine with itself to make this chlorine peroxide. That chlorine peroxide reacts with light to make chlorine atoms. Those chlorine atoms react to destroy ozone and to make more ClO. So this, this is catalytic um, over short time scales, meaning we destroy some ozone, but we keep reproducing ClO and O. This stuff is catalytic over sort of annual cycles. So as soon as the sunlight comes on, this starts to break down and make this stuff. But then when the sunlight goes away, this stuff isn't stable enough on its own. So it reacts back with the nitric acid in the clouds to make this stuff again. So that's kind of the seasonality of it. But as you can imagine, the more we increase the standing crop of halogens, and you can think of this exact same molecule, but with bromine in it. And the only difference is that bromine is even more effective at breaking down ozone. Um, it does essentially the same thing. Fluorine, as far as we can tell, doesn't do nearly as much of that kind of research. So this is the concentration of ClO. And as I mentioned last time, it's in mixing ratios, which um, when we're looking at you know, relative, their parts per something, in this case, their PPMs, um, relative to some other gas like nitrogen or what have you, so that we're not really thinking about it per, um, per uh, unit volume anymore. Um, this is the concentration. This is looking at latitudes, degrees south. So this is 62, it's kind of like southern tip of South America going into Antarctica at 72. You can see here that there. this is in uh, late August, so you got to put your mind around it's winter in the southern hemisphere in August, end of winter, okay? And there's this really strong concentration gradient. This is the edge of the polar vortex. So within the polar vortex at higher latitude, we have high concentration of CLO, and outside of the polar vortex, we have low concentration. And across this whole region, we have relatively high concentration of ozone, okay? Uh, the, and that's because it's dark and there's no light, and so there's no ability of this stuff to destroy that stuff. Move forward three weeks in time when the sunlight has come on and we start to destroy those um, ClO and O2 molecules to start increasing the standing crop of ClO. You can see how all of a sudden this has jumped way up, right? We're making more of this chlorine oxide. And now, because we have sunlight, that chlorine oxide is able to do its catalytic destruction of ozone as per this. And so we see the concentration of ozone drop dramatically, right? And right again at the polar vortex front. And this is, in essence, something that happens and lasts for several months every year. And as far as we can tell, it has always been the case for Earth for the ozone. So then you have to say, well, okay, so what have humans done to this? 
So what we have done is upset the balance of chemical reactions that produce and destroy ozone in a net sense, contributing to thinning. We have measured thinning, and I can show you that. But it's not thinning everywhere. It's thinning primarily over the poles with less thinning over uh, intermediate latitudes. And the primary things that we've done are introducing halogens to the atmosphere, especially chlorine and bromine. Uh, to, chlorine is, to a much lesser extent, also important here. And the primary way we did, way we did that was through chlor fluorocarbons, which are sometimes abbreviated CFCs, which you've probably heard people talk about. Um, Freon is a very common type of CFC that was invented in the 1940s and introduced very quickly as a coolant. So it was in refrigerators and air conditioners. And you know, if you grew up in the 50s, 60s, 70s, or whatever, people also use them as propellants for things like hairspray and um, any, anything that was in a spray, spray can. They were just sort of willy-nilly spraying this stuff in the atmosphere. We very quickly loaded up the atmosphere with these things without having any idea that they would break down to make halogens, which contributed to ozone destruction because people hadn't even thought of that yet. So this is kind of the basic way in which CFCs, which are were the primary source of halogens to the atmosphere, and even today, after these are now limited by the Montreal Protocol of 1990, um, still one of the main contributors, although not the main contributor anymore. The CFCs react with hydroxyl radicals. Remember, I talked about those last time as being that sort of granddaddy um, radical in the atmosphere that's important for mediating lots of chemical reactions to kind of rip a chlorine off and, um, and produce some CO2. And it's chlorine that goes into the catalytic cycle, chlorine destroying ozone to make some ClO, which can react with more ozone and catalytically reproduce itself. So in essence, we've added halogens. So now we've done these other things I've mentioned as well. We've increased stratospheric particles. We've increased nitric acid. It's not clear how much thinning of the ozone layer we would get from just those things without this. We don't really know. People didn't start making measurements seriously in the atmosphere. They're making some measurements of ozone that's starting back in the 50s. So we have some data, but not very much. But was in fact in the mid uh, 70s when a couple of chemists at UC Irvine had the idea that, that this might be happening. They ended up getting the Nobel Prize for it. But before that, before the sort of mid 70s or so, people, and they published a couple of papers, people hadn't really thought about the potential for this to be going on. And so very soon thereafter, sort of mid 70s is when we really start seeing intensive observations of the ozone layer. And all throughout the 80s and into the 90s, it was really. Um, thinning very quickly. The time scales associated with the chemistry of ozone in the atmosphere are short enough for people to notice what's happening and to have taken some kind of response. Whereas the time scales associated with global warming are probably about 10 times as long. And unfortunately, humans tend to not culturally make the necessary changes when something has a longer time scale associated. So you might say, well, okay, we just introduced this stuff in the 40s. Where, how, could, how pervasive is it on Earth? This is a diagram of the concentration of CFC-11. This is a type of freon, the most common type of freon, in the oceans. This is the Atlantic Ocean. And you can see it's been divided up. This is the upper part of the ocean, the first top kilometer, which is repeated in this part of this diagram. This goes all the way down to five uh, kilometers. And this is like a slice going right up the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, along a transect. They don't give you the degrees of latitude, but it basically goes from the southern hemisphere, or excuse me, from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere. And so we talked a little bit about the atmospheric conveyor belt before, but the, the coolest and saltiest waters, the ones that end up being the most dense, are formed in the current configuration of the ocean and the climate state in the extreme northern Atlantic Ocean. So the deep water is uh, interacting with the atmosphere and it sinks and goes down to the bottom. So you can see that Pink is the high concentration of CFC-11. It's pretty much everywhere in the shallow ocean. There's exchange everywhere in the shallow ocean. But deep water pretty much only penetrates to great depth in these extreme northern latitudes. You can see that in since 1942 or so, which is whatever that is, like uh, 80 years, this stuff has managed to penetrate all the way down, right? All the way down in the deepest ocean water mass as we see it. And in fact, this slide is um, about 15 years old. So 
it doesn't take very long. We find CFCs all over the place. We find them dissolved in polar ice. We find them in uh, the mo most remote parts of the planet and even in the deep ocean. So actually, a physical oceanographer has used this fact to try and understand something about the rates of bottom water formation. So these are some early measurements since the 1950s of ozone. So these are measurements in Antarctica um, over Haley Bay, one of the places at the coastline. These are measurements made the old fashioned way with either a balloon or, or pointing up to the atmosphere. You can see that starting in the 50s into the 90s, the concentration was decreasing. Those were dobs and units. So sort of 300 and maybe 350, um, you know, in the 50s, mid 50s, going down to about 100 dots in units by the year 1990. And there's a significant inflection or amount of decrease, which happens around 1970. Like it was decreasing, but then it really started to kick in. This is one of the lines of evidence we have that makes us think that this hasn't been a linear change, that human activities have caused um, some of this destruction relatively quickly, and that up through the period of these measurements, it was accelerating. 1990 is an important year because that was the year of the signing of the Montreal Protocol. This is another one of these plots that goes from the South Pole to the North Pole. It goes only 80 South to 80 North. So it's a little bit, it doesn't go to 90, but close. And then it goes December to December again. And you can, this is now um, estimate in percent ozone change per year over the period 1978 to 1990. So sort of, you know, somewhere in this period of time. And you can see that in the most intense areas, this is the polar night where there isn't much change and then the sunlight comes back on. In the most intense areas, something like 3% per year, right? So 3% per year over 20, or uh, excuse me, um, 12 years. So it's something, you know, close to 40%. So it's a significant cumulative amount. And, um, and again, these are estimates. These were times when we didn't have that great of an idea of what was going on and how much of this was natural, but this is just kind of measuring this integrated over a wider area. Whereas at the equator, you can see it's pretty much zero, not, not much change. And then in the Northern Hemisphere, you can see change, but not as much, roughly half as much. So then these are just a couple of other plots. This is showing you ozone integrated in a column of air between 1988 and 1990. These are specific measurements at different elevations that the concentration just in a two year period dropped fairly substantially. These are measurements over Switzerland. And if you just look above 15, above the tropopause, you see the concentration had been going down from the sort of early 70s, this is solid line is 69 to 70, then 79 to 80. 89 to 90. Interestingly enough, I'll talk about this next time when we talk about tropospheric ozone production as part of photochemical smog. We also see ozone increasing. This is for a completely different reason. And, um, and so we'll talk about it later. But you can see that you know pretty much everywhere we look, temperate regions or over the poles, there was a decrease in ozone. So this is um, a relatively early diagram comparing the period, this is an average of what was observed every year between 1957 and 1973. And this is an average of what was observed every year between 1980 and 1984, okay? And this is by months of the year. And so uh, this is over Antarctica, so the Southern Hemisphere thing. And we can see the same thing that we see pretty much um, in all the other diagrams that have provided this kind of information. There's a seasonality to the variation in ozone would have to do with when there's light, when there isn't light. And so even in the early days when measurements were being made, there's something like close to 100 dops in units of variation, okay? Some of that is probably natural and it almost has to be based on the processes we know that are involved. And then during this sort of later period when we know that more CFCs are going to the atmosphere, we can start to see what we call a deepening of the hole. Now, during the periods of time when it's, when ozone is being preserved, it's not nearly as uh, big of a difference, right? So the biggest difference occurs during the period of time when the hole is observed. And this is sort of measurements, this is over Toronto, this is in Canada, of the variation in um, ozone measured as wavelength of UV light. So the less ozone we have, the more UV light reaches um, the surface of the earth. 
And you can see here this kind of difference between winter and summer, which implies that there's some kind of thinning in the northern hemisphere is going to be offset from the southern hemisphere by six months. That the thinning that happens mostly over the poles extends to some extent to the temperate regions outside the polar vortex by some complicated mixing process. So this is just a graphic of you know what the ozone hole looked like in um, kind of September to October of 2006 over um, the Southern Hemisphere. So this is like this South Africa, Africa, Australia, New Zealand. This is Antarctica here. This just gives you an idea of what the polar vortex looks like, how it varies. You can see the date is up there. You can go to this website, ozonehole.com. You can find graphics that, you know, or more recent ones than this, but this one just happens to be a pretty good depiction. This was a year where it got very uh, deep. So you can see when these gray colors are developing, it's down here really low, right? Like a third of what it was, would have been when they first started making the measurements in the 50s when it was around 300 or so. And you can kind of see the intensity, the sharpness of this vortex. It isn't like that perfect circulating cone shaped thing like we saw before, it gets bigger and smaller. So sometimes it touches the southern tip of South America um, and sometimes it doesn't. And so part of that has to do with the way the oceanic currents um, affect the way this thing develops. So we'll actually see it extending uh, lower latitudes here beneath Africa because there's more space in the ocean to help direct the current, to direct the vortex. So these, I also have a series of plots that are satellite images. Um, this is what it looked like in September of 2000. Remember again, Montreal Protocol signed in 1990. It actually went into effect. The nations of the world, you know, some of them were you know proactive and started um, phasing out, but but it was signed in 1990 and said by the year 2000, you got to stop using certain halogen producing chemicals. So this is Antarctica, you can, and it's color coded for this sort of depth of the hole. And um, these, you know, orangish colors are relatively high concentrations that are outside the polar vortex. So um, interestingly enough, though, for the first sort of five to ten years of measurements, um, people had to go back and reevaluate the data because when they first started making these satellite measurements, they basically told the whatever processing computers that were looking at the data to throw out values less than 190. It's like, ah, oh, that couldn't be right. Obviously, there's a lot of values less than 190 in here. But there was a lot of confusion in the sort of mid 80s and early 90s about how thin the ozone layer was getting because uh, the scientists didn't believe the measurements. Then they went back and later you know, fixed that problem. And so we have better retrospective data now. So this is. Um, a plot showing you, and you, I show you the website. This comes from Cambridge University in the UK, sort of corrected um, ozone concentration depletions from uh, October 1980 into October 91. This was the primary uh, observations that were helping drive the signing of the Montreal Protocol. That over sort of just this one decade, remember this whole idea about ozone destruction really came to the fore in the mid-70s and about 75. So people started looking at this and you can see the deepening of the hole. It's not something where each year is worse than the, the year before. Like for instance, we see, oh, it's not as bad in 88, right? There aren't any purple colors down here, any of these really low values. So it fluctuates, it goes up and down. And of course that Pinatubo eruption, which I spoke of, started to affect the ozone layer really significantly, 91, 92, 93. I don't know if that's why that's not on this diagram or not, but you can also see that the shape isn't always exactly the same, right? And sometimes it's a little bit different than others. Um, this is common with natural phenomena. You need to have enough measurements over enough years to start to see the natural variability. Okay, so um, you can say, well, what's it you know, like more recently? So um, 2012 was a year that had a really intense ozone hole, and um, this hole was larger than the 10 years prior on average. So this gives us the idea that we can still have really significant depletions, even though we have started to reduce the processes through which halogens are added to the atmosphere. This is um, sort of 
you know, the hole at its very deepest, and this is in relative dioxin units, relative to what it had been uh, in the average before. You can see that it gets really low, like 70 units lower than typical over the last decade, over parts of Antarctica, but that, that, that we get to this polar vortex front and the amount of variation outside of that is smaller. At least in parts of South Africa, uh, excuse me, South America, we do see small amounts of thinning of the order of 10, 15 percent, um, but it really is restricted to the pole. Now, in a southern hemisphere, the northern hemisphere is more complicated. This is a view of the North Pole. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, but you can kind of see here's like Florida and Mexico. This is like the United States, Alaska. This is kind of Russia, Scandinavia, and that's Greenland. And so the whole up there, because the polar vortex is a little bit messier, we don't have this circumpolar oceanic current, we still get this isolation in the atmosphere, but it tends to not be as tightly constrained and as variable. It moves around. So you can see that as this thing was developing, this is just by you know one day. This is the 11th of March, the 12th of March, the 13th of March. The edges of this thing, they're kind of um, irregularly shaped and they touch land masses all over the place. They're not always touching um, populated, not, there aren't many people that live in any of these places, but that to a lesser or greater extent, like you can see to the extent to which they're touching um, Greenland, and there are people that live on the west coast of Greenland, for instance, it can be pretty significant. And the depth of the hole, while not as intense, this is again in relative units, so we don't see very many that go all the way down to 70, but we see plenty that are in this kind of pinkish color, which are, you know, 40, uh, 40 Dobson units shift relative to the prior average. So it's still happening. The other thing you'll notice is that the depletion extends farther out. There isn't as sharp of a gradient there as there is here. This is nice and sharp, whereas the um, northern hemisphere um, one is much more diffuse. So, you know, now we can say, well, so what are the future trends? Um, so the, you know, reduction came in in the year 2000. I think even though the protocol was first proposed and the meeting happened in 1990, they didn't get all, all the signatures they needed to have it be binding uh, until 92. Um, but the key point is what's been happening with ozone sort of pre-2000 and post-2000, which is when the countries of the world were supposed to start regulating the primary sources of uh, halogen stamps, which are Freon and other CFCs. There's a bunch of other unregulated sources of halogens in the atmosphere, though. Methyl bromide is a good case. So is methyl chloride. These are both in a category of chemicals called halons, which is a big category I'll talk to uh, in a second. There's some other halons, which are more halogenated and have less hydrogen. They're using various kinds of chemical fire extinguishers. Um, those are unregulated. And nitrogen oxides from airplane exhaust are also unregulated. So we've regulated a part. This is a very analogous to global warming and carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide accounts for about 50% of the warming that we're observing today. And it's the only gas that people have started to talk about regulating. Things like methane, CFCs, nitric acid, um, all of these things also absorb greenhouse gases and are contributing to warming and they're not monitored. So we should be seeing some changes, but it's a question of how much are we seeing with the health of the ozone layer was, um, regulating CFCs enough. And this is something that's kind of, you know, done by doing um, continuous monitoring. But I just wanted to <clears throat> spend a couple of minutes thinking about other chemicals and how we determine these. And so um, one of the things we have to think about is the atmospheric cycle for every gas in the lower stratosphere, which contributes to ozone depletion. This would be true if we're thinking about other chemical processes. So we need to know what chemicals might be involved. We need to know the relative ozone depletion potential, which is abbreviated as ODP. And people use CFC11, which is the primary ozone depleting chemical, the very first one, it's kind of the reference. So if you say something, oh, this other chemical has an ODP of 0.5, it means it's half as effective as CFC11, or if it has an ODP of 1.5, it's 50% more effective. So we wanna think about how good something is at depleting ozone, which is how good is it at making halogens. <clears throat> What's the reactivity in the atmospheric lifetime of a gas? So if a gas is very reactive, we put it into the atmosphere and within a couple of years, it does its ozone depletion and then it goes away. 
this doesn't have much of a long-term impact. Whereas if the gas goes into the atmosphere and it lasts 100 years, it's going to have an impact for a longer period of time, but per unit time, less of an impact because less reactive. We also have to think about biogeochemical cycles, which especially from marine aquatic ecosystems and some terrestrial flooded ecosystems like salt marshes, um, they can produce some halogenated gases naturally to the atmosphere from photosynthesizing plants to contribute to the natural standing crop of ozone depleting chemicals. So like a lot of other processes on Earth, when humans change something, it's not like we've introduced something that was completely brand new, we've upset a natural balance. So we kind of want to know, well, what are the natural balances? So I just want to spend a couple of moments about how we sort of determine this stuff. <clears throat> So the first thing is, this is just a definition of the ODP of a chemical. And it's, um, you know, this is basically what it is. It's just a calculated steady state reduction in ozone from a particular chemical um, relative to an emission rate that um, produces that amount of decrease compared to the same parameter for CFC11. <clears throat> so if we had a chlorofluorocarbon where, oh, you know, Let's stop using chlorine. That's CFC stands for, these are usually um, like CFC11. It's a two carbon molecule with fluorine and chlorine. You could make a CFB where you replace the chlorine with the bromine and have some of the same properties. It's a heavier molecule, um, but bromine is much more catalytically effective than chlorine, about 50 times in ozone destruction. But because it's a heavier gas, not as much of it's going to get into the atmosphere. So you can calculate the ozone depleting potential for brominated molecules and see that they're still relatively significant because bromine radicals are so reactive. So this is from a paper that came out in uh, 2000 in Nature, looking at what were thought to be the primary sources of halogens to the stratosphere that were promoting ozone destruction. So you can see in green the various kinds of CFCs. These are just different isomers or different uh, use of chlorine atom is on one or the other carbon. That's what these numbers uh, mean. <clears throat> then we have carbon tetrachloride. You know, it's a really common chemical used in um, industrial processes. It used to be used, I don't think they use so much anymore as a, um, something that they knock you out with, uh, you know, before surgery. This is ethylene trichloride. We've talked about this a little bit in groundwater. It's used in a lot of industrial processes. So those are shown there in blue. Hydrofluorocarbons, these are like CFCs, but they're not fully saturated with halogens. They've got some hydrogen in them. Um, halons as another category. And then you can see here methyl bromide and methyl chloride. You can see an A and an N. The N is the natural component, and the A is the anthropogenic component. You can see in both cases, the anthropogenic component is thought to be smaller than the natural component. So human activities maybe aren't having a dramatic effect, but this is something that people have been looking at for the last 20 years to sort of decide, yeah, is this pie chart right, right? Is there much more natural or, I mean, excuse me, much more anthropogenic than we realize? But as I say, the Montreal Protocol pretty much only isolated stuff in green. You know, something a little bit less than half of the pie. And these are just, I'm not gonna kind of go through this, but if you want to, you can look in the notes. It tells you the name, and the chemical formula for a whole bunch of different stuff that you see in the literature, different kinds of halogenated hydrocarbons. This is kind of an interesting uh, plot from a paper that came out in 2009. So this is by year, various gases contributing to ozone depletion. And so you can see here CFCs, that class of uh, chlorofluorocarbons, which were green on the last slide, you know, from, you know, it, these were introduced again in the 40s, so starting in the 60s, they were thought to not have that much effect, but increasing very, very rapidly up until about the year 2000. Montreal Protocol goes into effect. The gases stop being produced. It takes a few years for the standing crop to start to go down, and it's starting to go down. And so everything past 2009 is a projection, right? It's sort of saying, yeah, well, you know, at this rate, we project, we project the stuff going to keep going down. But by the year 2060, it's still significant compared to what it was in 1960, right? So some fraction of the CFCs are going down, but not all of them. Now notice here, this is the natural methyl bromide, not changing over this time scale. Methyl chloride, 
which is also largely naturally produced. This is this ethylene trichloride, which we've talked about, also peaking is starting to come down, carbon tetrachloride, um, peaking um, and diminishing slightly, hydrofluorocarbons sort of being a relatively small contribution, co fairly constant, halons coming up and not really going down, right? I mean, uh, there's some idea that at some point in time, people may put in some kind of control and so it's allowed us to thin a little bit, but right now it's an unregulated gas. So you could have, he could have easily drawn this the same. And then up here is the methyl bromide anthropogenic. And so I, um, at the end of the day, if we have time, I'll go through a little bit of how we determine the relative proportion of the anthropogenic to the natural. It ends up actually being really pretty complicated. But you can see like at first blush, dealing with CFCs is the primary thing. And the next biggest thing on here are the halons. And if we um, you know, decided that the thinning of the layer has not been controlled enough back to sort of early 60s through 80s values, then that would obviously be the next target. It's going to be a very hard one because they're very um, used by a lot of different industries. So these are halons. Um, this is just a plot show. There's a whole bunch of different ones. The name tells you, A, how many carbon atoms there are in it, one or two, and what uh, the halogens are. And so I, I don't know where they came up with the system, but if you have a bromine, it gets a one. If you have a chlorine, it gets a two. If you have a fluorine, it gets a one. It's sort of like in inverse order, but I think it's, um, I don't know if it's named by their ozone depleting potential, but that is what they are, greatest to least. And so it's a big class of chemicals. And like I say, some of them are used as fire retardants, fire extinguishers. There are other processes that they're used for, like methyl bromide is a really common pesticide, uh, fumigant pesticide. So as a class of chemicals, they're important for a lot of industrial processes. They do break down to make halogen radicals in the atmosphere and contribute to ozone depletion, and they're at present not regulated at all. So I showed you this table last time. I just want to remind you again about the various time scales associated with um, destruction in the atmosphere of different gas. So CFCs, like we've been talking about, on average, right, and it's a category, so each CFC is a little bit different, but we're talking about sort of a half a century or so for them to persist in the atmosphere. And they are destroyed in the stratosphere by the kind of chemicals we've already talked about. So that gives you an idea that if we stopped in the year 2000, that most of the CFCs we would have put in will be gone by about the year 2050, right? That's how long it takes. Whereas halons, they tend to be more reactive. They tend to, we produce them and they do their business in something less than half as much time. So then they're more reactive and more destructive pound for pound. It gives them a higher ODP. These hydrofluorocarbons can break down really quickly. Um, in fact, oftentimes in the troposphere, they don't even make it up into the stratosphere. Uh, same thing for HFCs, whereas PFCs, perfluorocarbons, are much more stable. They can actually manage to make it up above the stratosphere and are destroyed in millennia in the mesosphere. So these are also not contributing to ozone depletion. Um, so this is just a, a kind of a simplified way of thinking about this standing crop of a gas in the atmosphere and how much we have, where it's coming from. And one thing to think about is the average mean life of a gas. And so this is one over the mean life. It's sort of like a residence time, but without having to find a specific volume. So the total residence time of a gas or a molecule like CFC11 is going to be one over its mean residence time in the gas phase, like in the presence of light reacting the atmosphere, plus one over the amount that we find in the oceans. Pretty much all gases that we find in the atmosphere, including CFCs, some fraction of it will dissolve in the ocean and we'll find it in the upper layer, like we saw for CFC11, and the amount coming off the land. And so for different gases like methyl bromide, which has a significant natural component, these are going to be bigger than they are for things that are pretty much just anthropogenic and just used by human activities like CFC11, which is mostly going to show up here. This is um, a box model. We've talked a little bit about box models before, but this is just to kind of illustrate how complicated this is. This is a troposphere, this is a stratosphere. We got gases that are emitted off the land or ocean surface into this box, okay? And 
these things can react with light and they can degrade through a series of steps and be washed back out of the atmosphere. Some of this gas will make it up through the tropopause into the stratosphere, and then we have the same thing. And so for a lot of these gases, and think about the halogen as we talked about, the source gas might be CFC11, but then we make the halogen radicals and it goes through a catalytic cycle, which is more complicated than what that box implies. Um, but then, then eventually we have, you know, whatever the final reactants are, and we're oftentimes looking at the amount of something like the amount of chlorine radicals produced by putting CFC11 while recognizing that we are also um, destroying ozone in this particular case. And each one of these gaseous products can exchange between the atmosphere of uh, you know, reservoirs, between the stratosphere and the troposphere. So it takes an awful lot of measurements. A lot of these sort of airplane flights, they go up and sample for specific gases at specific latitudes to start to put in the information that's needed to understand how these gases vary, how do things like water vapor content, seasons, uh, volcanic eruptions, you know, et cetera, affect them. So it's really pretty complicated. This is just a slide explaining mixing ratios, which I've already kind of gone through, um, so I'm not going to repeat, just to kind of remind you what they are. This is some plots of CFC-11 starting in the late uh, 80s, going to the late 90s at different locations on Earth. And so we see some of the seasonality, like we see in CO2, some wiggling to the curves. Not all the curves are exactly the same values, right? We see um, lesser value in the atmosphere over Samoa than we see in the atmosphere over Mauna Loa, which is this kind of greenish color. Um, and, and yet, um, I think what we can see in all of them is that all of these gases were increasing, the CFC-11, in these different locations until the sort of early 90s, thereabout, and then they kind of flatten out. And if you squint at it enough, you might, in this data, in 1998, you might say, yeah, they flattened. Maybe they're decreasing a little bit. But to my eye, that's a flat trend. That might be slightly decreasing in, in this Point Barrow um, location. This is more recent um, data uh, coming up on the next slide. But this is basically what went into, as forecasts, the Montreal protocol, which is basically take these curves as sort of natural variation, predict these are different scenarios, usage scenarios. Okay, if we outlaw, you know, all CFC 11, you know, for um, all different products or some products we keep letting like uh, air conditioning in cars were something that for about a decade, they kept allowing it because, you know, for people who still had old cars, they weren't going to uh, retrofit their systems. And so that's, that's why you end up with these different scenarios. But since the mean lifetimes of, of, of CFC-11 in the atmosphere are so low, you don't get a lot of variation here. We'll see when we talk about global warming later. Since the mean lifetime of CO2 in the atmosphere is a lot longer, the different scenarios, the loading scenarios, end up having a much bigger effect on what will it be in the atmosphere you know, 100 years out. Um, this plot is the more recent plot. So this is data from just, um, you can see here, January, 2020. And um, this is, you know, they kind of changed the way they were making the uh, measurements. But this this right here, you know, this is 1995. So 98 would be somewhere in here. So this was the data from here over that we had depicted on those prior plots, like these plots here. Um, but this is average over all the different sites. And like I say, there were different, different ways in which the measurements were being made, different programs making them over different periods of time. But you can see that there really is a decline. Uh, it's not a gigantic decline, right? It has, it's, it has, in the year 2020, we were back down to sort of where we were in like the year 1987. It's not like, oh yes, we've, people oftentimes talk about this as being one of the biggest successes of um, the global community in reducing a uh, environmental problem. And I agree, it is a relative success, but it's not that big of a success when you think about the fact that even a very dramatic limiting of one of the gases that represents the major source has only taken us down in concentration by something like 20%. But it also kind of illustrates the fact that there are time scales associated with this. We can't just stop something and have it instantaneously recover. It's just not how it works. So um, this is another gas 
This is, um, you know, ethylene trichloride, as I've mentioned before. This is it also building up in the atmosphere and then diminishing around the signing of the Montreal Protocol much more quickly. It's a much more reactive gas. It has a much shorter lifetime. And so we can see its concentration. It's another one is regulated chemical. Its concentration decreasing more greatly. This is, you know, different locations of measurement. So you can see some offset in concentrations. But it starts to recover really uh, quickly in the atmosphere, which is an encouraging um, thing because it should decline more quickly. So this is um, a comparison of ozone and atmospheric temperature in the stratosphere, at the base of the stratosphere. If you recall, I showed you last time there's this temperature inversion that happens at the base of the stratosphere. And we can see, you know, both of these two things, the temperature and the ozone go together. Ozone up, temperature up, ozone down, temperature down. And you can see the, the two eruptions of the last part of the last century that were big enough to put significant particles it was in the Philippines, this one was in Mexico. And in one case, it represents a spike. In another case, it represents a diminishment. So this is complicated. Their, their um, Pinatubo happened closer to the equator, was able to spread more of its gases in the southern hemisphere. El Chichon, central Mexico, less of an effect on the southern hemisphere. So that might be why there's a difference. <clears throat> but you can also see this is, um, you know, over sort of the same period of time, um, the concentration of CFCs in the atmosphere, the, what the stratosphere looks like, and what um, Earth's temperature looks like at the surface of the Earth. There's some sort of tracking here. Ozone, in some complicated ways, also involved with uh, global. So most of the last packet, I'm going to go through the last part kind of quickly. It's here if you're interested in it, if you're not interested, don't worry about it. But I want to spend a little bit of time talking about methyl bromide because it ends up being a really complicated gas. And how we know this is relative natural amount, this relative anthropogenic amount. And as I say, I, there aren't any definitive answers because it's really pretty complicated. But methyl bromide also contributes to ozone depletion. It's got a pretty significant natural um, source. And the natural source is coming out of forests, wetlands, and the surface ocean. But there are some anthropogenic sources, which are biomass burning, so I think deforestation, fuel combustion, um, wood stoves, uh, coal to a lesser extent, pesticide use. And so we kind of want to know, well, that we know it's contributing to the natural ozone cycle, but how much of this have we added? And you know, from those plots, um, the estimate is it's pretty small. And so that's the takeaway, I think, is that, yeah, it's pretty small. It's not zero. And we probably only know that number good to about plus or minus 100%. I mean, it could be twice as big or about half as big, but it's not going to become as important as halons. I don't, I don't think we um, understand it that poorly. <clears throat> so it's uh, you know, considered an HFC. It, some people will put it in the halon category. Um, officially, it is a halon, but most people think of it as an HFC. It breaks down more quickly than the typical multi-halogenated halon. This is just a couple slides about, so methyl bromide, for instance, is used as a fumigant in um, the agricultural industry, and it's used in a whole bunch of different um, industries, tobacco, ornamental flowers, nursery stock, buying turf, strawberries, tomatoes, you know, it's used for a lot of the goods that are produced in one part of the world and transported somewhere else, and it's, it be very hard to see the global agricultural industry stop using it. So it's a gaseous source to the atmosphere, which, you know, it's quantified. We know what these numbers are. We know where they are. But um, like I say, the replacements would be very expensive. And so it's, it's hard to imagine that going away. This is just a little bit of information if you want it from the National Pesticide Information Center about sort of is toxicity of LC50 and what the effects are in humans. You can read, read it at your leisure if you're interested. <clears throat> so methyl bromide was identified as an ozone depleting chemical in 81. It was officially added to the list of things that should be considered for regulation. And the net result was that it wasn't going to be regulated. It was kind of like, oh yeah, we're going to schedule it for phase out, but it, it's still widely used in the United States. If you get your house tinted, termites are using methyl bromide. And so basically the United States 
was allowed to continue using methylbromide in other countries as well, up to 90% of its original use. And this is just sort of, just from the agriculture, uh, the kind of amount in sort of year 2000 dollar, it's, you know, it adds up to somewhere over a half a billion dollars of the annual production crop losses that would occur if they weren't allowed to use methylbromide. So the methyl bromide cycle is kind of complicated. Um, it is destroyed in the gas phase by reaction with hydroxyl. It's got a relatively short half-life. Um, it comes from the land and, uh, you know, both produced from the land naturally and taken up. There's the ocean um, production by phytoplankton and there's taking up um, by dissolution in seawater, which is a temperature dependent thing. And so and the time scales associated with this are a couple of years, two to four years, two years up here. So the whole uh, idea is, is that methyl bromide cycles in the atmosphere are happening sort of uh, semi-annually or biannually, I guess is how you think. Um, so this is again from that paper from um, the year 2000, showing you for methyl bromide, the sort of idea of what the flexes were. So uh, <clears throat> oceans, pretty big. Fumigation, all those agricultural uses, pretty big. Gasoline, there, but it's not gigantic. Biomass burning, pretty big. These are natural processes. Salt marshes, production of rapeseed, uh, which is, you know, makes an oil, it's very common in China, for instance. Some fungi, and then this is the amount that's missing, meaning in the year 2000, they couldn't account for something like half of the total production. That's why I say we we'll probably know that number to about 50%. Um, there's a lot of, lot of sources or sinks that we're just not sure about where, where they come from. So the way the marine flux was figured out was to make some measurements at sea in the seawater and in the air and to look at variables like how soluble is methyl bromide in the air, how much are phytoplankton producing, not in terms of, uh, but by just sort of quantifying the total phytoplankton quantity and the concentration in the water, and so there were a series of cruises, you know, one here, one that went on a transect, one in a box over here, taking that data and sort of coming up with empirical relationships that relate the amount of methyl bromide to the seasonality and the temperature. And they're, they're pretty flaky measurements, but basically this was sort of in one of those studies, the methyl bromide measured in the air in a bunch of different longitudes, the methyl bromide in the water, a ratio deciding is it saturated or undersaturated um, with respect to the air, and then coming up with an empirical relationship. This is for the spring and summer, this is for the winter and the fall, which basically relates the surface of the sea surface to the amount of methyl bromide people think is in the ocean. And from that, you can come up with these plot because you have satellite measurements of methyl bromide in the ocean that sort of say that yes, as a function of the seasons, during the winter months, uh, most of the oceans are sink. They're pulling methyl bromide out because they're cold, except in the southern hemisphere, we have a little zone here that's super saturated, right? And so it's, it's just because it's outside of the, it's north of the Antarctic polar front. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, we have relatively high production, the sunlight is on, there's lots of photosynthesis, the water is relatively warm, so we're producing. And then we get a band in the northern hemisphere that's not quite as intense in the summer that basically does the same thing. And um, so people can integrate and figure out kind of a flux from that. From the land, we have a bunch of different sources to consider. There are anthropogenic sources, there are salt marshes, there are rice fields, there's the action of fungi and temperate forests, mostly on a breaking down of wood. Um, and there's some abiotic uh, degradation of organic matter. This is a much more difficult flux to calculate. And so there's a few more slides in here that they kind of come to the end. I'm not going to go through, but this one is determined by some measurements in the UK where they looked at what at exhaust coming out of automobiles, right? in one place and look at, well, how much methyl bromide comes out when we burn gasoline and how is that related to carbon monoxide concentration? Then we're gonna integrate that to carbon monoxide production across the whole world and come up with a number. And it's like, if, if you thought the oceanic numbers were flaky, this one's really flaky, but it's the best number we have. Measurements over salt marshes, again, looking in the water, looking in the air above it and trying to figure out seasonality and so forth. Same thing with the rice fields. Each one of these things um, ends up being 
they're, they're significant, but they're not um, so significant in terms of how they vary annually that um, the net effect is, is that the combination of this plus the combination of the marine cycle far dominates over stuff like bromine from fossil fuel contribution and um, other sort of natural or other anthropogenic sources, which is why we end up with, um, you know, this anthropogenic bar being kind of small and a natural bar being kind of big. But like I say, we don't really know it. Um, it's an interesting problem from a scientific perspective. I think you know, a lot of people are still interested in trying to understand this and understand whether or not we do need to minimize the amount of methyl bromide that's being used in agriculture, or is it um, money better spent in other ways on other things? My personal opinion is to be much better to figure out replacements for halides, right? To re replace them, because they're obvious unregulated production of halogens in the atmosphere. And we've done a pretty good business on this. And it's going to take some time for that to go away. Uh, but because the lifetime of, of methyl bromide in the atmosphere is so short, and because we think the anthropogenic contribution is small compared to the natural contribution, it's just not clear how much oof we're going to get out of regulating that. So um, I think I'll leave it there. And like I say, there's a, there are um, about 10 more slides that look at the specifics of the salt marshes and the natural production. And you're welcome to look at it if you want to out of interest sake or not. Um, it doesn't really matter to me. But this is the gist. And so hopefully through this discussion, you realize that um, the ozone hole is a real thing. To some extent, it's a natural thing. Humans have upset a balance of a very complicated set of chemical reactions and particle contents that um, are forced by things like the seasons and other naturally occurring processes like the occasional large volcanic eruption. And the lifetimes of the gases in the atmosphere are such that we can shut off using something and it's not going to instantaneously recover. It takes some time. And all of these problems become magnified when we talk about global warming because the lifetimes of the important gases, the methane and the CO2, they go up by like a factor of 10 or so. And so it's stretched out over time. Even if we stop doing what we're doing now, it's going to take not um, half a century, probably going to take more like a millennia to recover. That's just what it is. All right, so I will leave it there. Are the sources in the salt marsh and the rice paddies in the ocean, is that microbial? Yeah, different? so um, it's a little bit like, different um, in the different locations. In the oceans, it's primarily photosynthesizers. Mm -hmm. um, in the uh, forest, is primarily, there is bromine uh, introduction into kind of the trees, growing trees, and then when they die, they are um, kind of regenerated by fungi. And that's what produces the largest source of methyl bromide back in the atmosphere. In the salt marshes, it's um, reductive processes happening in the sediments that are also in effect breaking down organic matter. That's microbials, more kind of redox matter mm -hmm. process. So in each case, plant matter is concentrating halogens out of the environment in their biomass. And then there are things that go on to break them down and cause the liberation.